All right, hey everybody. We're going to uh, undertake a big chapter today, and um, I'm gonna do the best I can through the online lecture format, but I would say this if we were face-to-face -face or online or whatever, chapter six on learning is one of those chapters that you have to dedicate some extra time um, to understanding on your own. You're gonna need to definitely read the chapter. Um, there's so much to go over. I'm gonna hit the highlights like I try to do without going on too long. Um, and I'm gonna recommend you watch any supplemental videos you can find on the different types of learning. Um, even when I teach it in a regular semester face-to-face -face class, this, this chapter can take two weeks and we still don't get it all done. Um, I joke with my students a lot, uh, and it's especially true with this chapter, that the information we learn in chapter six, I had to learn as a psychology major over f two, four, six semesters. Uh, it's condensed. It is, um, it's definitely something that where you, you just get a little taste of it, and uh, hopefully you understand the basic terminology and some overall theories but don't get down if it tends to be a little bit topic heavy, um, term heavy, um, you know, information heavy. So we'll do what we can and I'll go through them one at a time. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of terms. If you open up your PowerPoints, um, you're going to see a lot of terms, but I'm going to start with just the general definition of learning and uh, conditioning. Learning when I first ever probably took a psychology class, which some of you, this is your first psychology class, I never heard of this topic specifically. Uh, I think I thought that if you're going to cover learning, that we would be talking about elementary school and how we learned. What I didn't realize is how much learning is infused in everything a human does from the moment they're born till the day they die. Learning is everything. And even though it is a biological process, we can pick apart learning and we can understand theories of learning for multiple reasons. We need to understand, um, in a lot of cases, how we learned what we learned so that in some cases we can unlearn it. If we've, become, we've um, adapted or adopted bad habits in our lives, uh, we learn those habits, so how can we unlearn those habits? Uh, if we're trying to understand the people around us, which all of us are all the time, some of us more than others, we need to understand why they're, why they're that way, how they learn those behaviors so that we can understand them better. And a term that I use um, with my students a lot or a phrase that I use is that we have the capacity in the majority of the time in some cases this isn't the truth but in some in most cases it is we have the capacity as conscious educated people to um, and even as people who are not aware of these theories to train the people around us how we want to be treated so all these things have to do with behaviors how do i train my children to treat me in a certain way how do i train my spouse my friends my boss my subordinates um, my neighbor, my, you know, anybody we have consistent human interaction with, and I say humans because these theories are often tested upon and, and used in animals as well, but when we interact with people, we train them based on what, we, what behaviors we reward and what behaviors we punish, how to treat us in the future. This is theories of learning. So it's very helpful information as a parent. It's very helpful in your relationships where you stop and pick apart wh why somebody is treating you in a certain way. And then in some cases, you can retrain them to treat you in the way that you want to be treated. I always say to students, you've already trained everybody in your life how to treat you. Um, you might not be happy with that training. You might not be aware of that training, but you already have. So if you don't like the way your blank treats you, then you need to train them differently. And in most cases, with most functional human beings, these methods work. Let me give you an example. Um, if you don't like the way that your 
little brother or little sister um, bugs you or picks at you or tries to get attention in a negative way or maybe even how they treat you disrespectfully. Now, what I'm going to teach you, I mean, I'm using this example, but I need a note that we're not tell, tell, teaching you how to train your little brother how to treat your parents. We can't be responsible for that. We can only really affect the way your little brother treats you. And you have to, you got to hope in some situations that that training can be uh, generalized to other people. But in the field of psychology, one of the worst things you can do is start believing that you can change and fix other people. And really, you can influence other people, but you can change and fix yourself. And then in hoping by doing that, other people will see the change and then learn by looking at you. But that has to be their conscious decision. You can't fix your parents' relationships, your children's relationships. Um, you can only fix yourself, and you have to hope that that um, adapting of your behavior affects others. I hope that makes sense. So focus on yourself. So if we're focusing on your ability to change your relationship with your little brother, let's say, um, you don't like the way he talks to you, you don't like the way he gets into your stuff, you don't like um, his disrespect, well, in some capacity, and if you're aware of this or not, you have rewarded that behavior of his in the past. And we know you've rewarded it because it happens more often. So in the field of learning, we have to redefine some words that we're familiar with in our day-to-day -day life. And the, the definition of learning from the field of psychology is this. It's a relatively enduring change in behaving, behavior or knowledge as a result of experience. So it's relative change. So any kind of change that lasts for a significant amount of time, depending on the change in the behavior that you can observe or you can ask somebody, have, has, have you changed your thinking? But it's change. So it can be in your behavior or your knowledge as a result of something that happened, an experience. An experience happened and a behavior change occurred. That's the definition of learning. So anytime you change your behavior, you have learned to do something differently. This kind of shows us how you learned it um, and how to apply those techniques to other people. So back to the little brother for just a minute. His disrespect, his of your things, your properties, yourself, has been rewarded in the past. So what can be complicated is to figure out how he's being rewarded for it. And it could be because um, he needs the attention, good or bad. It could be other things, but let's go with that. He likes attention. He's learned that he gets attention by making you mad or driving you crazy or picking at you. And therefore, to get your attention in the future, he knows what to do. He knows what buttons to push. Man, most people in our life will work for attention. You know those signs on the side of the road? Somebody who doesn't have a job will will, will, will work for money. Um, we'll work for attention a lot of times, especially in relationships that we care about. So be very careful of what energy, what reward what reinforcement you give to certain behaviors because where you put that power, where you put that attention, where you put that energy is what grows. And so when we focus on somebody's bad behavior, the laws of behavior say that that behavior will get worse or that behavior will happen more often. When we focus on behavior we like, we reward or pay attention to uh, productive behavior. No. And again, you got to know what that productive behavior is. But when you put it, your energy into that, that grows. Oftentimes I see with families that the kid that is bad gets all the attention. And the good kid, she just or he just does their thing, doesn't get in trouble, and pretty much is invisible to the family unless the family needs you to do something. There's a problem with that method because what you're actually doing on a certain level is you're rewarding with attention the bad behavior and you're ignoring the good, which is the opposite of what should happen. Now, I am not advocating in any way that if your kid is bad, you ignore that behavior. In fact, a lot of these behaviors need to be trained early on because it's hard to undo a bad behavior and then retrain, but it's possible. So that's the big theme of this chapter. Um, I will cover some um, 
specific terminology is it associated is associated with the different theories of learning but let me tell you this and this is actually so I don't forget um, in your notes or in the PowerPoints the very last PowerPoint of this chapter is a book called don't shoot the dog if you were a psychology major you would be required to read this book on your own it is the classic manual and Karen Pryor is an expert on training behavior, I should say, because she she learned a lot of these learning techniques um, at, by practicing them on dolphins and animals, but they work for people too. So um, if you, I would just kind of, uh, you know, make a, a request. If you have relationships in your life right now that are just, they've just been trained wrong, uh, get this book, uh, get it on tape, I mean, get it a recording or, or order the book on Amazon. A used copy would probably be around $5. Um, it's called Don't Shoot the Dog, and it gives easy-to-follow techniques on how the principles we learn in this chapter can be applied to day-to-day -to -day life. Probably one of my top books I would recommend is um, Don't Shoot the Dog. If you ever have questions about, you know, you just find this information fascinating, you want to go to the next level, um, just throw me an email and say, or go to my fr frequently asked questions discussion board post and say, uh, Professor Z, what books would you recommend? I I'm digging this psychology stuff. And man, I can give you some really good starter books that, um, that I think you'd enjoy. So we covered the basic definition of learning and then we need to switch gears and then talk about the word conditioning so this chapter should be called conditioning because conditioned means learned <clears throat> and so um, we're gonna kind of stop using the word learned and we're gonna start using the word conditioned so conditioned or conditioning is the process of learning associations between environmental events and behavioral responses. We're gonna look at the connections between why we do the things we do. And um, like I said, hopefully you'll start using the word conditioned instead of learned, and that will help you with this vocabulary. And you'll go, maybe stop even here or immediately after I make some of these introduction connections that you go to the crash courses and watch the, the videos. Um, I think it's interesting too that as we cover topics in psychology, we learned that um, we go back in our memory and think, oh, wow, that was in The Simpsons or that was in The Office. You know, you think about there's certain TV shows that are so intelligently written that they incorporate a lot of the theories that we probably talk about in class. And so um, you start making that connection, and I think that's good. So I put a little, cl uh, little clip of The Office there. All right, so classical conditionings. So three types of learning in this chapter. Classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. There are other theories of learning. These are the main ones that we're going to talk, talk about. Um, classical conditioning has been associated with the scientist Ivan Pavlov. So Pavlov was a Russian um, scientist who are, was actually studying uh, digestive systems in, and in dogs. He was doing experiments with dogs' stomachs, and he discovered classical conditioning. Now, it's not that classical conditioning didn't exist before Pavlov identified it, but he was the first theorist to um, notice this phenomena and uh, study it in more detail and came up with a lot of these, um, this vocabulary associated with it. So classical conditioning is the first theory of why we've learned what we've learned in our lives, and a lot of these theories kind of overlap, but let's talk about some terms. On slide four, classical conditioning terms. So you have, if you look at this list, you see the pattern. Unconditioned, unconditioned, conditioned, conditioned. If you go down the row, the first words. And then you see stimulus response, stimulus response. I like patterns. That helps me learn things. So if something is unconditioned, it's not learned. It's automatic, it's a reflex. If it's conditioned, then there's been a change in behavior due to some experience and it's now learned behavior. Conditioned is learned, unconditioned is not learned. So when you pick apart and you understand the um, theory of classical conditioning, you start with a uh, natural stimulus that reflexively elicits a response without the need of prior learning. To me, 
definitions um, like that can be more confusing than they have to be. Think of it this way. First of all, you have the unconditioned part. It's not learned. So you were born with it. It's an automatic reflex. That's that part of the definition. The second part of the definition is understanding the difference between a stimulus and a response. A stimulus is uh, a stimulus response relationship is, I like to explain it like as a cause and effect. Um, a stimulus is something that is absorbed through your sensory experiences and the response is what you do with that. So it's good to give examples of this. A stimulus response relationship, uh, especially one that is unconditioned, would be a reflexive relationship. If I put food in a baby's mouth, and even our mouth, I mean, uh, the food is the stimulus, the thing that evokes a response, which is to salivate. The mouth waters when food is placed in the mouth. Um, uh, if you go to the eye doctor or something comes towards your eye, a puff of air in the eye in the eye doctor exam and a blink, that's an unconditioned stimulus response relationship because it's not learned. You blink with air coming in your eye. You don't learn that. And secondly, the stimulus is the puff of air and the response is to blink. So when it's an unconditioned stimulus response, it is a not learned relationship between something that is given and the response to that stimulus. Then after learning occurs and this process of magical <laughs> classical conditioning, then you have to label what is the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response. So now we know that um, there's a change because it's gone from being unlearned or unconditioned to being conditioned. We'll talk about that process when I talk about the dog experience, but let me finish trying to define these. So what used to be something neutral then becomes a conditioned stimulus. So the stimulus changes and the conditioned response is the same response you had before you learned what to do. So let me give you an example and hope this makes sense. Let's use the puff of air example. Most people can relate to that example. So what you have there is um, you're in the eye doctor kind of feels like this weird situation with a camera in my face and the technician asks you to put your chin on the machine look at the light huh and she blows or he blows a puff of air in your eye you blink and then well that was weird I think it's like a cataracts test or something so the first time you do it you don't really see it coming you don't know it's coming you're just doing what you're supposed to do and then you're like well that was weird and you and you blink that wasn't learned air makes your eye blink but then the next time you go to the eye doctor, you might have this test again. They ask you to put your chin on the machine, look at the light. Oh, you know it's coming. So you start blinking. Well, they can't get the test if your eyes closed. Stop blinking. I'm trying not to. Why are you blinking? There's no air. You're anticipating what's going to happen because from the last time that happened, you learned that putting your face on this machine is going to make a puff of air come out. If that puff of air comes out, it's unpleasant and you blink, but no longer, it's no longer the same response because, well, it's the same response. It's no longer the same stimulus. There's no air. It's just the machine. The machine itself without the air shouldn't make you blink, but it does. So it goes from being the, the puff of air makes you blink to just the machine makes you blink. Then the response to that is exactly the same. So it goes from the air to just the machine. The response is to blink and to blink. So when you go through the process, you understand that in terms of classical conditioning, you'll have an unconditioned stimulus, an unconditioned response, and in this case, it's the air makes you blink, not learned. Then you have something neutral. In this case, it's the machine. You put the machine with the puff of air and you learn to associate those things together now the machine alone makes you blink. Let's look at the actual example that Pavlov discovered in his labs, in his lab hundreds of years ago. So what he found when he was studying these dogs is that, um, and again, he was, a, he was a scientist that was studying nutrition, not psychology, not classical conditioning. And the way he happed upon or recognized what was happening here is that he would put these dogs, him and his assistant, there's always an assistant, uh, putting these dogs in these mechanisms that they built, 
They were going to um, give the dogs meat powder food and then collect the dog's slobber or salivation. That was their experiment. I don't know if they were measuring the saliva or what they were gonna do with it, but. So they built these kind of contraptions and the dog would kind of be in a little, you know, uh, contraption and they would lift this little door, give and present without them seeing their faces, I guess. They would give the dog this bowl of meat powder, the dog would eat the meat powder and then fill up this beacon or beaker of saliva, uh, saliva. That's not that interesting in the field of psychology. So your mouth waters when you eat. Great. Good to know. Unconditioned stimulus is the food. Unconditioned response is the salivation. What made this complicated and interesting that he noticed, Pavlov noticed, is that after conducting these trials a couple times, then the assistant would hook up the dog to the mechanism. Pavlov would enter the lab, clop, 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 with his you know, loud shoes on the hard floor. The dog would hear Pavlov's footsteps and start to salivate before there was any meat powder in the environment. So it made Pavlov stop and say, why is he salivating to footsteps? I don't salivate to footsteps. You don't salivate to footsteps. But what he realized is the association. And the association was that the dog now paired together or associated those footsteps are coming, that must mean food. And if it must mean food, my brain starts to salivate, make my mouth salivate. So there it was. Classical conditioning was discovered. And in this case, um, he took that information and he extrapolated to a bigger study. So he said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna test this. We're gonna put the dog in the contraption, no food, and when I say go, give the dog the food. Or when I ring a bell, give the dog the food. So Pavlov gets a dog, <laughs> gets a bell, and rings it, looks at his associate, and then they give the dog the food. He gobbles it up. The next day, puts him in the contraption, rings the bell, gives the dog the food, the dog eats it up. Now what Pavlov's trying to do is associate getting the food, not with his footsteps, but with his bell, to see if he could train the dog to drool or salivate just to the bell. And guess what? That's what happened. So after a few trials, after a few pairings, they hooked the dog up, rang the bell, and the dog salivated. They could now ring a bell in any capacity for this dog and the dog would salivate to anticipate food. He had paired the, the, the food was coming with that bell sound and that was classically now conditioned. So in the slide five, again, you you're gonna have one of each, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. Then an introduction of something neutral like a bell that means nothing until it's paired, and then it turns into a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response. It goes from being unconditioned, unlearned, to conditioned and learned. So the unconditioned stimulus in the Pavlov example was the food. The food and the response to the food was to salivate, natural automatic reflex. Then they started to use the food and the bell together and put those two together and timing matters. And when you would get into this on, a, on a, a higher level, you would learn about timing, schedules of reinforcement, all those like complicated layers to this. But for now, let's keep it simple so we can learn it. Then you have the bell and the food together and then you take away the food, you ring the bell and the dog salivates. It's not that different, I guarantee, than if you own an animal and in your home um, I could speak for dogs and cats. I think those are, I had a, had a fish once, but the poor guy jumped out of the bowl and ended his own life. So I'm not good with fish, but let's talk about dogs. I'm good at dogs because Charlie, she's so easy to train. So it's not unusual that if you have, let's say a cat and your cat loves wet cat food. And the first time you give that cat that wet cat food, maybe you have a can opener. And give that cat the food. The cat loves that food. That cat can so quickly pair the sound of the can opener to that yummy wet foods are coming. Not the first time, 
because I don't want a can opener associated with. And maybe it takes a couple times. I'm not sure. I have to train a cat on my own to see that now as an older person. But the sound of the... So then you find that, oh, I'm going to open this can of beans or I'm going to open this can of corn. And you turn on the can opener and the cat's going, meow, 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 meow. And if you had a little mechanism, you could probably measure the saliva. That cat's mouth is watering because that cat thinks that wet cat food isn't coming associated with the can opener not just the food so um with my dog um it's not so much the food that uh, they've been trained to kind of freak out over uh they freak out over leashes and charlie has a brother named herman we have two dogs and so um they've been trained that if we touch a leash or or we say the word let's go for a walk um they'll start freaking out because they've associated that with the freedom of getting to leave and smell smells and run around. So we have to be really careful about saying those words. Those words mean nothing unless they're paired with that experience. It goes from being unconditioned to conditioned. All right, so the next thing are factors that affect conditioning. And these things are generalization, discrimination, extinction, and spontaneous recovery. So for these, when stimulus generalization occurs, that means the occurrence of a learned behavior not only to the original stimulus, but other stimuli as well. I'll use things we're familiar with now. Let's say um, Pavlov's dog, and he trains him to salivate to the bell. What if he trained him, or that training is now generalized to any bell? So it doesn't have to be the original bell. It doesn't even have to be the original tone of the bell, but that that dog now salivates to anything that he generalizes that sounds like the bell. So you've got Pavlov's dog, let's say in retirement, out in the country, no big deal, did his work, and then somebody rings a dinner bell and his mouth salivates. Which, by the way, a dinner bell. I mean, I don't know if you're that familiar with the, like old movies and westerns where there's a dinner bell. Obviously, that was classically conditioned, that the workers heard that bell and came a-running because the food was coming. Think about it. Bells. So with Pavlov's dog, he hears a school bell, salivates. The phone ring, salivates. Anything that sounds like a ring of a bell, if Pavlov's dog uh, salivates to any of those things, that means that behavior's been generalized. And on the flip side or the opposite side, stimulus discrimination is when they only respond to the specific. So if the opposite happened, and he didn't respond to any bells, any tones, only the bell he was trained, that's considered stimulus discrimination. Extinction in classical conditioning is when um, the pairing starts to weaken and then it goes away. So um, if you were uh, um, a cowboy out on the range and you heard the bell ring and you came running every time because you knew the food was coming, but if somebody just kept ringing the bell all the time, and there was no food there, eventually you'd stop salivating. You'd stop anticipating food was coming. It'd just be a bell. You can, it could be overused or used without any food ever again, and that behavior would go on what psychologists call extinction. And once a behavior has gone away, um, spontaneous recovery can occur. Um, this can happen psychologically. Uh, that's when it comes back out of nowhere after it's diminished or gone away. I talk to my students about um, car accidents, and oftentimes um, people that have serious car accidents will associate the place they had the accident with the fear of the accident. So even though the accident caused the accident, the cars, the situation, sometimes you can be terrified or associate fear with the location the accident occurred. So you might not drive at the corner of Beltway in Fairmont because every time you do, you get this fear all over again of being in that accident. That was because it would be classically conditioned. Um, And so the accident now, or the location now makes you feel the fear of the actual accident, okay? So in that situation, let's take a second. The, um, The collision, the accident causes fear. That wasn't something learned, that was unconditioned. The association with something neutral was the location. After learning occurred, the conditioned stimulus was the location and the conditioned response was still the fear. So the fear happened either way. And the first, when it was unconditioned, it was the accident that caused the fear, but the accident's now associated with the location. 
Now, after learning, the location causes the fear. Then extinction occurs if you, which is what you got to do in a lot of cases when things like these are classically conditioned. If you have to continue to drive that route over and over and over, and the fear gets less and less every time, you kind of just push through the fear or you use some kind of relaxation technique to get through it, then eventually most people will be able to drive that drive without the fear coming back from the memory of that accident. That would be extinction. The association went away. Spontaneous recovery would be that out of nowhere, maybe six months, a year, two years, 10 years, you drive in that location and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, that fear comes back. That would be an example of spontaneous recovery. All right, from Pavlov, then we have Watson. And Watson uh, was a psychologist that named his uh, theory of beha behaviorism, and it's still learning. And he started advocating scientific study of observed behaviors. And so he conducted the case of little Albert, which is another very famous classically conditioned um, study. Um, but this one now, instead of the dog and conditioning the dog to respond to a bell, he, Watson, which is very unethical, let's just say that, uh, conditioned a child to develop a fear that he didn't have already. So the famous case of little Albert, an ethical and today's standard, um, but an unbelievable example of how emotions like the car accident can be cl classically conditioned. So with the case of little Albert, I'll just give us, you know, kind of a quick synopsis and you can um, listen to the other examples and explanations of this. Uh, with the case of little, uh, little Albert, basically a mom uh, volunteered her infant to participate in the study of Watson and his assistant Rayner. And this was in the 1920s, y'all, and there's actual footage of it. So in this case, they bring in this little baby who could sit up, interact, um, and they expose this infant or this toddler, I would say, they're probably, he's probably around crawling age, um, to a bunch of different animals to see if the child had any negative response to animals. And here's the thing about fears. Most of us aren't born with any fears. It's a negative association that creates those fears. And I should say, the younger that ne the younger the age of the of you or the individual that is exposed and learns that fear, the harder it is to undo that fear. So this was young, this was his first experience with these things, and that's why it had such negative consequences. So before conditioning, they would um, introduce the baby to a lot of animals. The baby had no negative responses. Then, as part of the test, and this happened over different trials, they would make a loud sound behind the baby. Uh, that you would use a steel bar and they would hit it with a hammer to make a clanging sound with the baby not knowing it, the baby would respond, startle, and begin to cry. Now, his, the, fa the fact that the baby did uh, have this reaction to the startling noise is unconditioned, is not learned, it is reflexive. He's a baby. It's scary. Unless he had serious hearing problems, that would be a normal reaction for, for this toddler. So they established the unconditioned part. The unconditioned stimulus was the sound and the response was to startle. Then they introduced the neutral. They would, in this case, um, give the little baby, sit the baby down and give the baby a, a little animal. And in this case, it was a little white trained, you know, tame rat. They'd put the rat in the baby's lap. The baby would see the rat, you know, begin to be curious about the rat, and then they'd make the loud sound behind little Albert, and he would startle and begin to cry. The rat didn't do anything. It was the startle. It was the sound. They did that trial a few times where they, again, put the baby down, gave the baby the rat to play with, sorry, and, sorry for that, um, they would give the baby the rat, make the sound, and then the startle response would occur. This would happen just a few times to where the baby started to associate the scary sound with the rat until eventually, and it didn't take long, they brought him into the lab, put him down, gave him the little white rat to play with, and what do you think little Albert did? He started freaking out. 
even without the sound. He had been trained to be afraid of the rat because he associated the rat with the fear that he felt when he heard the sound behind him. So in this case, before conditioning occurred, that neutral thing was the rat. It didn't create any fear. Before conditioning occurred, before learning occurred, the sound made him cry. That was unlearned. It was unconditioned stimulus evoked an unconditioned response. During conditioning, during the learning process, they paired the rat with the sound. And then after he was conditioned, it was the rat that gave him the fear. Notice this, the unconditioned response and the conditioned response is the same. It's still fear. What changed is that he was afraid of something automatically, naturally, reflexively, like a sound. And then he learned to be afraid of a rat itself because he associated it with what was once something neutral, just a rat, nothing dangerous until he associated it. A lot of fears, phobias, things that we learn as children that we don't always understand why we have certain responses to it, we're classically conditioned. Another theory of conditioning is called operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is a little bit different from classical in that it deals with learning active voluntary behaviors that are shaped and maintained by consequences. So with operant conditioning, it can explain for behaviors that are rewarded or punished in our day-to-day life. Um, And when I use the word reward, I'm really going to substitute that word for reinforced. So if you are reinforced for a behavior, by definition, you're going to see that behavior happen more often. And if you're punished for a behavior, you're going to see that behavior happen less often. So this is learned through a process called shaping. And shaping, and we have another um, theorist here by the name B.F. Skinner. He believed that psychology shouldn't just look at things that could be um, objectively measured, but um, also things that can be um, outwardly observed and, and interactions with environmental events. So with shaping, here we've got another rat. I never noticed that kind of um, rodent pattern here. But anyway, so with B.F. Skinner, he, dis- he took some properties of reinforcement and punishment, and he applied them to training a rat, not hurting a rat or a dog or anything of that sort, um, but through a process called shaping. So shaping is, I'll, I'll tell you the definition, then I'll put it in different language. Rewarding successive approximations of a desired behavior. What shaping means is when you want a desired behavior, if you want somebody to do something or act a certain way, you have to have that behavior in mind to train it, to shape it, okay? So let's say you want your dog to sit or you want your um, significant other to be more affectionate. Um, Now, the problem might be that in the past, your significant other wasn't affectionate and you rewarded it. And so then a year or two down the road, you're mad that they're not affectionate, but you didn't realize you rewarded them not being affectionate for a long, long time. So it's hard to retrain somebody where you trained them to not be affectionate. They still got what they wanted in the relationship without having to do what they needed to do to um, respond to you. So shaping can be complicated when you've already shaped or um, kind of trained a behavior in the wrong way. It's hard to get your kids to be respectful if they've been rewarded for not being respectful. Does that make sense? So um, my suggestion to you, if you've not been a parent, is to learn these methods before you have kids or if you're in a relationship um, or before you're in a relationship, learn these methods. And then if you've already trained or shaped somebody in a way that's undesirable, it takes a little more work to untrain them and retrain them, but it is possible. Like I said, go back to that book. So basically shaping means that you have a desired behavior. You want blank to happen and you're specific. You want your kid to clean his room, okay? You have the desired behavior. And what you do is you reward little behaviors that come closer and closer to the ultimate goal. So you don't say to your kid, uh, clean your room and wait for them to clean their room and then reward them. One, it probably would never happen. And two, that's too confusing. So you start little. When they're young, you say, um, we need to take care of our stuff and you model that behavior. You help clean up the room. I always tried to do this with my kids and it worked with two out of three. Um, It's just make it easy for them. 
you know, what does it mean to have your room look organized so that your stuff is taken care of and you know where to find it? Well, you have the blue bin, you have your socks, and in the red bin you have your other clothes, and the yellow bin you have your your guys, and the you know this bin you have your Legos. You 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 make it easy. That all you have to do is throw it in there, and you just put your blanket like this and your pillow, and you put your clothes in the dirty laundry. So you have a system that is trainable for the subject. And then every time they see you do it and then they do it, um, or if they do it on their own, you reward it. So the first thing you need to know when you're training behavior is what is the desired behavior. The second thing you have to know is what is a reward for the person or animal that you're rewarding or you're trying to change their behavior. If you are giving doggy treats to your child as a reward to get them to do something more often, that's not gonna work. If you're giving a dollar bill to a toddler, they don't want a dollar bill. So you have to figure out for the person you're trying to train, what is a reward to them? And in a lot of cases, food works with animals and humans, but also just positive attention, words of affirmation, and, um, and things that make them feel good about themselves. So ideally, you show your kid, this is how we clean up. I expect you to take care of your room and clean up. You model that behavior in the room and around the house. And then when they do something, then you reward it. Good job. Look at you cleaning up. I'm so proud of you. You're just a hard worker. And you continue to notice those behaviors and put the attention in the good behavior. As you reward and reinforce it, by theory of learning, it should grow or increase. If you only punish your child when they don't do it, then you're giving the attention in the wrong place and you're gonna end up growing something you didn't intend to. So when you walk by their room and see the room isn't cleaned, you're so lazy. Why can't you clean up? Why can't you respect your stuff? You don't value anything. I'm ashamed of you, I'm embarrassed. Whatever you say is you're now giving them the time of day, the attention, the energy to tell them how bad they are. And what that rarely does, which blows my mind with parents, what rarely does is motivate them to change. Oh, now I'm gonna clean up my room because they're embarrassed or ashamed of me. I gotta get my stuff together. I don't wanna be this person. That doesn't usually come from somebody they care about. What usually happens is they give up. Well, why clean? I'm lazy. Why do my schoolwork? I'm stupid. Why take care of my stuff? I obviously don't care about my stuff. So. It's not always this crystal clear black and white, but the main concept is to focus on and reward and shape the behavior you want to see happen more often. So with terminology of reinforcement, you have two kinds, positive and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is when you give or add something to the situation, it increases the likelihood that it will happen in the next situation or more often in the future. So if you reward a behavior in a way that your subject wants to be rewarded, positive reinforcement means you give them something like hooray or a dollar or food or whatever they want and then that behavior happens more often. Negative uh, reinforcement is a response that results in the removal of or an avoidance of uh, a punishing stimulus increasing the likelihood that response will happen again in the future. So either way with positive or negative, if it's reinforcement, the behavior happens more often in the future, but what makes it positive reinforcement is when something is given or added, and when it's negative reinforcement, something is removed. All right, so with slide 13, it kind of gives you examples of negative and positive reinforcement. And on slide 14, it, ex it talks about types of punishment. So if reinforcement by definition um, ensures that that behavior is gonna happen either more often or the same in the future, then punishment by definition means it's gonna happen less often in the future, um, either because uh, a consequence occurred or to avoid some kind of negative thing from happening to you. I tease a little bit about tickets, um, speeding tickets with my students. So if you get a speeding ticket for going over the speed limit, for whatever reason, you broke the speed limit, you get a ticket, um, and then the next week you're speeding and you get another ticket. For that individual, a speeding ticket is a reinforcement. Why? 
because you were given a ticket and your speeding either increased or stayed the same. It didn't have a long-term decrease effect. If you did it again, it was a reinforcement. And you say, wait, 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 I don't want a ticket. Well, something's happening there because if you're getting a ticket and you're continuing to do that, then either the reward of speeding is, you know, preferable to getting a ticket or the, the punishment wasn't harsh enough so that you didn't do it ever again. If it was a true punishment, then you'd get a ticket and you'd never speed again. And in a lot of cases, what we think is a punishment is not. And I always ask people, especially when they have teenagers, if you're trying to um, get a certain result out of your child and you're implementing some kind of punishment and the child continues to do what you don't want them to do, then you need to stop and reevaluate that what you think is a punishment is not because it's not working. A punishment is only truly by definition a punishment if the negative behavior decreases. If it stays the same or even gets worse, then you need to reevaluate your, ta- your, your tactics. Sounds like common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people, um, including myself, make a mistake of you know doing what you think is right or what your parents did, but you're not getting the results. So at some point you gotta stop, reevaluate, and if you really wanna change the behavior, you have to try something else. All right, so there are operant conditioning terms, uh, stimulus, shaping, and extinction. Uh, We talked a little bit about shaping. Uh, Then at the end of the chapter, it talks about observational learning. And with observational learning, it's probably the easiest for me to teach. Um, This involves studies, uh, classic studies done by Albert Bandera. Um, he believes that most behavior is acquired through observational learning. And in that case, it's a duh, like, of course it is. But again, I'm blown away by, especially parents that don't realize that children learn by watching, uh, especially when they're younger and most influential, uh, or most influenced. So, um, the parent philosophy that says, do as I say, not as I do, don't see that being very effective in good parenting. Observational learning, regardless of who you're learning it from, is how a lot of us learn initially most of the things we know. Um, But more importantly, imitation and observation should be something that is consciously controlled. If you want your child not to lie, then don't lie. (laughs) If you want your child to take care of their stuff, take care of your stuff. I mean, it sounds simplistic, but in some ways that it is. It's a lot of pressure. I won't say that it's easy. And nobody's saying you have to be perfect as a parent, but it's very difficult to retrain or expect something out of a child when they haven't observed it through their own learning process. Um, And then after they observe their parents, when you do have some control over them at a young age, then they observe the people and the society around them. And that's when you need to be consciously aware of who they're around because they're learning behavior from watching others. Then later, they're probably rewarded or punished for that behavior, but they learn it usually through observation. So at a time where your children start making friends or when they start getting on the internet or where they start um, you know, wanting the attention of older siblings or, or older cousins or older neighbors, um, as much as you possibly can as a caregiver, you want to um, influence who they're around because it can make all the difference. Um, A colleague of mine was asking about my children years ago, and they said, well, how's, you know, she doing at school? And I said, oh man, she works so hard. And I said, "Uh, you know, she's got some great friends. They're really good students, really good kids. And he said um, something I'll never forget. He said, Claire, he said, show me your child's friends and I'll show you your child's future. And what he meant was how important influences are as your child goes through their life about what they want to be, what they can be, how they see themselves. Observational learning is how they learn to be who they are. In a lot of cases, those, those role models in whatever form they take um, are very, very important that they're good people, that they're productive people, that they don't like show your child um, or your little brother or sister or your cousin um, how to do bad things, to do things that are destructive. And, I, and I'm and i not just talking about parents here, because these are teachers, these are uh, uncles and aunts and cousins and, and, all, and siblings. 
so I so I'm speaking to people that have any influence over anybody, especially people younger than you that look up to you. Um, be careful what you do because you're teaching that child to do it. And if you want what's best for that child, and I hope you do, then you you do what you can to role model um, the best behavior. It's kind of how I started out the chapter. You can't really change people unless you can change the response to you or you can adapt your behavior to be a good role model and they look at you and say, well, what are you doing? And what? how did you have a successful marriage or how did you get a degree? I will say this, if you're watching this video, you're trying to make your life better because you're going to college and there is somebody out there, either a little brother, sister, cousin, nephew, child, child that hasn't been born yet, is gonna learn to persevere, reach their goals, have a career, change their life, improve their circumstances because they observed you doing this. So I'm proud of you for that. Um, read it, go over it, and um, hopefully this was a good foundation, broad and narrow, to help you understand this material. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.